Um, Bridget Latham, as I mentioned, is Emeritus Professor at the EUI in Florence. She was director there of the um, Robert Schumann Institute for Advanced Studies until she left uh, upon retirement in August uh, 2021. Before that, she was Professor of European Politics at uh, UCD's School of Politics and International Relations. And she was Vice President of UCD and Principal of the College of uh, Social Sciences. Human Sciences and Law, which is in its various uh, designations, uh, from 2004 to 2011. Professor Laffin was the founding director of the Dublin European Institute in UCD from 1999, and in March 2004, she was elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy. Um, Paul Gillespie uh, directs the Constitutional Futures After Brexit project, as I mentioned, in UCD's Centre for Peace and Conflict Research. He's also a columnist and former foreign policy editor with the Irish Times. He's published widely on British-Irish relations and European integration issues, Irish foreign policy, Europe-Asia relations, and he's co-editor of Britain and Europe, The End Again, An Irish Perspective. And Dr Gillespie is also a long-standing member of the IIEA's UK group. So a very warm welcome to you both here today. Um, Bridget, I will um, invite you to uh, share your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Eve, and thank you all for, for, for coming today. And before I begin, I just want to recall Brendan Halligan, uh, because Brendan would absolutely love to be here for this discussion today. And he was always preoccupied with the UK's attitude to Europe and the potential consequences for the island of Ireland. And he began uh, with Paul and many of you in the audience, the UK group, which did Trojan work that meant when Brexit began to appear on the horizon. In fact, this was where there was knowledge here uh, about, uh, about the UK and its relationship with the EU that served the country well as it confronted uh, Brexit. And Ireland remains the member state most affected by the United Kingdom's departure from the EU. So the book, uh, the EU's response to Brexit, united and effective. The whole argument of the book is on the front. <laughs> it's there in the title, united and effective. And so uh, what, why, this, why this book? I remember the evening of that referendum and knowing it was gone very early. Uh, and I also remember thinking they don't know what they're doing. And because they really hadn't prepared, I'd spoken a lot in, in London at various events and other parts of the UK during the referendum. And also we had at the EUI uh, an event in the October, which one of the lead EU negotiators who had just taken over his job in the task force, Stefan Durank, came to. Bobby McDonough, our ambassador in Rome, came. And we had an engagement with the uh, UK in a changing Europe group. And it was very obvious that they still didn't know what they were doing and that they were much too complacent about just how difficult disentangling the ties of deep interdependence would be. So the book, in a way, I was carrying around this book in my head for a very, for a very long time as I was doing other things and running the, the Schumann Centre. And I also want to pay tribute to my co-author, Stefan Tella, who was an early, who is an early career scholar. He was my postdoc at the EUI working on differentiated integration. And it was an absolute joy to work with a young, uh, I shouldn't say young, an early career scholar, because he really, you know, we, we developed this book through argument and engagement uh, and really enjoyed it. It was a genuine collaborative uh, endeavor. So the book, uh, we need to think back to 2016, when the initial response to the, to the outcome of the referendum was that the EU could be in a spiral of disintegration, domino effect, there might be other UKs lurking there. And I was very struck both by the response of political actors, media actors, and also academics. They all took an extremely pessimistic view of what had happened in the sense of the EU's uh, ability to deal with the shock. And this was a large, significant member state that was opting for, for the exit door. 
So there was an expectation that the EU's res crisis response would be uh, would not be effective. Uh, the disintegrative potential was was there, but there was also in EU institutions, and particularly for UK uh, civil servants in EU institutions, this was a very emotional experience. As someone said to me, there were lots of tears in the Berlin Mall on the twenty fourth of uh, on the twenty fourth of June. Because I was determined from the very beginning to keep a very close eye on this and engage very actively with those uh, responsible for, for the exercise, but also because it was important in Schumann that we did something on Brexit, I kind of lived with it from June 16. And I still, I mean, I still follow it, the consequences, but the book in a sense is the is is the outcome of all of that. And we did interview very intensely, very intensive interviews with about 30 of those who negotiated this on the EU side. And we relied for the UK on the UK and a changing Europe archive for, for the British side. So in thinking about how to do the research, uh, we were determined to have an analytical framework that would help us organize this melange of material uh, that we had and the first part of the the first part of the analytical framework was framing how did the eu interpret uh, brexit the problem frame and then what was it going to do in order to respond to the action frame and how did it create the capacity internally to adjust and to cope with this and so we looked very carefully at how the EU amassed resources to diffuse UK brinkmanship. Uh, and we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which the Foreign Office did think that it could divide and conquer. It had an internal exercise where it looked at every member state, saw the strengths and weaknesses and relationships with the UK, and began to think where the soft spots or neuralgic spots were, where they could get support. So the EU was determined not to give the UK the opportunity for brinkmanship. And how they did this was extreme, they were extremely consistent in terms of objectives. They were it was there was political ownership of the Brexit process from the beginning and also at critical moments. In other words, the command ship was operating and there was extraordinarily technical preparedness. So those were the those, that was the these were the ingredients. But let's talk firstly about framing on the morning on the Friday morning after the referendum in less than 24 hours, uh, Donald Tusk issued a statement. That afternoon, there was a statement of the four presidents of the institutions, the EU institutions plus the presidency, Mark Rutte, uh, the Netherlands was in the presidency. And there, there was an assertion that the EU would remain the dominant organization for, for managing interdependence in Europe, that the EU would protect itself uh, in this process, and that the EU would be united. And that not everything was going to be about Brexit for the next uh, five five years. Then this was endorsed by an informal summit of the 27 a week later. And by the end of that week, the EU had a problem frame. Brexit was a common, it was a common uh, challenge for the EU and they would stay united in order to, uh, to, respond, to respond to it. And that was, at the time, it was rhetorical unity. There was an aspiration to unity. But then the EU went through an exercise collectively of transforming the rhetoric into a practice norm. In other words, they worked very hard at remaining united. And they did this by creating capacity. So within every institution, there was a node to manage Brexit. In the council, there was the Article 50 group. Uh, Didier Sawes chaired it from beginning to end. He was uh, he was a senior. Uh, he'd been in the Van Rompuy cabinet, very experienced. In the commission, there was Task Force 50. And of course, Juncker, 
uh, decided that it needed a political heavyweight and he opted in July for Barnier and Barnier agreed to do it. In the European Parliament, the Bureau, the presidents decided that they would have a special representative on Brexit, et cetera, et cetera. So in every institution, they created the, the, a task forces that were going to manage this. And the re, there were the reason was that they firstly wanted a one-stop shop and they didn't want, in the words of one senior council official, they didn't want Brexit to pollute the entire EU system. So they created a cordon sanitaire within the system uh, around, uh, around Brexit. Then they worked very hard on process. There was firstly no negotiation without notification. No one would speak to the British until they notified the following year. Uh, there was, uh, Barnier was determined to be transparent. All EU negotiating lines, mandates, even the, even the PowerPoints of their internal seminars on Brexit were put online, everything was online. And the reason why Barnier went for maximum transparency was he didn't want different member states to hear different things at different times, keep the capitals on board, but he also simply wanted to put it out there. This is what the EU wants and this is what we'll agree to, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they built in uh, they built in protections for the EU in the in a process sense in that the divorce first, but even within the divorce first was the determination that uh, there had to be the famous sufficient progress before the EU would talk about the future. And this was to put pressure on the British not to hold out on the big issues. Uh, and those three issues, as we know, were money, uh, citizens and the border on the island of Ireland. Uh, and uh, that it was the first crisis in the negotiations when Madame May went to lunch in the Berlaymont to sign off on the joint report uh, in December 17 uh, to be, literally she had to leave the room because she hadn't told the DUP what she was signing up to and all hell broke loose in front of everyone. I mean, it literally happened uh, as lunch was, uh, as lunch was taken. And then they went back into the negotiations. The EU, another technique the EU used was it published draft treaties, color coded. This is what we've agreed. This is what's not, this is what's almost agreed. And this is what we're still negotiating on. So there were lots and lots of ways in which the EU, in its determination to have an orderly Brexit, uh, built in all of these, uh, all of these protections. And then, uh, of course, they then needed to, uh, once they went into the tunnel and there was a withdrawal agreement, we know that May could not get her withdrawal agreement through the House of Commons. And from that point on, as things politically deteriorated in the UK, the EU began to take a no deal Brexit very seriously. And they began to do all the preparatory notes and all, all of the, what would happen goods in the market if there's no deal. What would happen? A, B, C, D. It didn't matter. They had they had looked at it. And of course, May couldn't get it through the House of Commons. Uh, it was not possible. And then you had the off-pitch uh, checkers proposals on the future relationship, uh, which again, uh, for some member states, might have been the basis as a starting point for a future relationship, which would be closer than we've ended up with. But there were lots of member states very worried about the so-called cherry picking uh, in checkers. So then we arrive at, uh, we arrive, there is, uh, I think Boris Johnson would have gone for a no deal Brexit, but he was, he hide bound by the House of Commons and couldn't. And then he had to agree a withdrawal agreement and he did had an election, 80 seat majority and passed. And then we went into the future relationship negotiations run by David Frost on the UK side, which were an extraordinary set of negotiations. Nothing happened. They had no text agreed. Right, quite late, up to October, November, there was no text agreed. 
there were texts available, but none agreed. And that was because Johnson constantly thought if the EU are going to give in, they don't want to know. He, he really did the brinksmanship. The other um, thing was that the EU also decided, OK, he doesn't want the Court of Justice, won't live with it. He uh, doesn't want dynamic alignment, won't live with it. So the EU began to construct uh, four people began to construct an alternative to the level playing field via the Court of Justice, and they came up with a mechanism that, in the end of the day, the British had to agree with. So, as we know, uh, it went right to the brink to Christmas Eve. I think there will never again be a corporate meeting uh, on Christmas Day, but there was. Uh, and shortly after, uh, the treaty was agreed. It was the the content of that of the TCA is as thin as it could possibly be between entities that were really interdependent. It's a very thin, it's a very, very thin agreement, but it was the the pathway to an agreement was so narrow given the red lines on both sides. The EU was never going to concede. Uh, on level playing field. It was never going to, it was going to have to be assured uh, in that treaty. Then, as we know, the implementation of the withdrawal agreement was extremely challenging and it required the Windsor framework. So we're now in the non-ideological phase of EU-UK relations, uh, but we're still left with uh, a set of two pillars of an agreement that are thin, uh, and that certainly there are winners from Brexit, uh, but they're not the UK. Uh, and the one Brexit dividend the EU collectively got was the RRF. I do not think that, the, in fact, I think the evidence overwhelmingly suggests that the EU could never, ever, ever have agreed to the Recovery and Resilience Fund with the UK as a member state. It simply would not have happened. They'd have forced the EU to non to extra treaty, an extra treaty route. So again, we're left with uh, the geopolitical shifts and shocks, Ukraine, uh, relationships on dealing with sanctions and Ukraine are, are, are close, but it's still an extraordinarily thin arrangement for given the geography of the United Kingdom uh, and the EU. So the Brexit story will continue. But that's my contribution to it for now. Thank you very much, Bridget, for that um, wonderful um, opening um, uh, account of the argument of your, your new book, um, The EU's Response to Brexit. Um, and I'll invite uh, Paul Gillespie now to um, offer some reflections on the book. Thank you very much. And this is the most interesting and enjoyable book. Uh, um, I, I want to raise uh, several issues arising and which highlight the approach of the book and uh, the contribution that it can make to further discussion and argument. Uh, the first major point that struck, struck me is the geopolitics lying behind the um, uh, the EU's conduct of this and preparation and um, the detailed work that it put in, there was a very clear awareness of existential challenge that Brexit posed uh, to the EU uh, in the political setting of the time. Uh, uh, and what's very striking is how aware the political leadership in the EU were of that and how they organized and orchestrated the preparations around that. Um, the book um, identifies clearly how um, rapidly, uh, as Bridget explained, uh, the, the, the major decisions were put in place, how rapidly the uh, decision was taken uh, to organize the task forces, uh, the politics of um, uh, choice that were involved, and this close cooperation between the institutions, between uh, um, Juncker and Tusk uh, and uh, Verhofstadt from the, the Parliament, uh, it really come through very strongly. And this makes, excuse me, I don't know. <laughs> um, 
This makes, this adds to Bridges' argument about the development within the EU of what he calls the collective power Europe, uh, which contributes then to the subsequent um, activity of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the EU around COVID, uh, around Ukraine, around the issues of the rule of law, about, about forthcoming enlargement. And I'll raise the question at the end of how it contributes or, or not <clears throat> uh, to the current uh, um, arguments about the Middle East. Secondly, the theoretical approach that's taken is elegant and very challenging and interesting. Uh, Bridget uh, and Stefan uh, tell a go beyond the normal or often used uh, liberal intergovernmental uh, approach to this with rational actors and economic interests and member states playing the major role. They under they say that this underestimates the, the leadership and politics and institutions. Uh, and then they develop this model of issue framing, agenda setting. Uh, the question is, what is the problem? Uh, what is to be done? Uh, how you develop capacity to do this? And the very useful uh, framework of this uh, um, organizes the argument through the book uh, in a way that's engaging, uh, particularly the way they uh, understand the question of framing. The framing in the sense that um, uh, you highlight perceptions of an issue and, uh, and organize, I just find the quote, uh, organize uh, the... Um, Issue framing refers to se selectively highlighting and masking interpretations to shape a message in communicative interaction. And what's striking in the book is the way they organize the highlighting issue, the selective highlighting of, 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 of issues and approaches, and also the masking of them. So if you're doing something selectively, you're highlighting some things and, and, and in a way disguising others. Uh, and this is an empowering uh, uh, activity, and that's a strong uh, it gives a strong framework, as I say, itself to the book, uh, 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 which, which carries through to the end. Personalities and leadership and politics matter very largely in these set of decisions. We've heard Bridget talk about the personalities and, and policies on the British side. And when you compare and contrast the two approaches, it's quite extraordinary. And it's not at all surprising that the UK was outwitted in negotiation in the way it was. But what really strikes me is Juncker's political wisdom and skill in those uh, few initial months, a capacity to work with with Tusk uh, and, and with the other institutional players. And the appointment of Barnier and identification of Barnier uh, 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 were really skillful, imp important decision making. Um, now that cuts across uh, uh, the, the major several issues that uh, Bridget raised again about the British cherry picking uh, um, approach, the divide and rule approach. Uh, and uh, they had, in, as Bridget said, insulated the problem from um, from such uh, a policy from the British side uh, in a way that actually worked and effectively worked right through. And um, uh, it's interesting, Bridget takes up, uh, and Stefan, in the conclusion, criticisms by Ivan, Ivor Roberts and Jonathan Fall, two of the major uh, British personalities, um, uh, Ivor Roberts negotiating on behalf of, of Britain, Jonathan Fall, uh, one of the leading, the leading uh, British uh, uh, officer in the commission, but they developed a criticism that the um, uh, commission and, and the EU had taken too much of a process orientation towards this. Of course, the, notoriously, in a way, uh, the EU is good at process, uh, but Ivor Roberts and Jonathan Fall say they put too much uh, pro process in and not enough strategy. Uh, uh, and the decision to use Article 50 in the way they did uh, um, meant that there were they weren't able he, from the EU side to imagine a bigger deal for such a large member state with such a distinctive set of interests. And Bridget simply counteracts that by saying, look, 
uh, it was up to the British to stra strategize their approach uh, compared to the EU's stratification of, of, of that approach and strategization should I, of that approach within, within that geopolitical geopolit setting. And it is extraordinary as you go through the, select, uh, the successive chapters to see the ill preparedness of the British compared to the uh, exceedingly detailed and open preparedness of, of the EU side. Um, now that contributes, fifthly, to the collective power Europe argument the book makes, uh, which is which has been developing over the last uh, several years, um, where uh, the capacity, the framing, the ability to bring together uh, the different elements of, of the EU uh, add to its power in subsequent events with the COVID, with Ukraine, as as you mentioned, with the uh, uh, with the, the budgetary and fiscal issues that arose, um, and whether these indeed uh, were more effectively carried out uh, without the British presence. Uh, and um, that's a major uh, contribution uh, to the uh, uh, decision-making capacity of the EU in subsequent years. And one, you know, there, there's a, there are tools here, including analytical tools, with which to evaluate that performance. And I'll come to that in a moment. As for the uh, the British outcomes, um, uh, it's it's striking how the uh, most sober judgments in Britain about the outcomes of Brexit are, are showing that it's lost control of events, that it's lost, uh, it's been a setback economically uh, in, in regulatory terms and in many other ways. Uh, they're ending up with a weaker economy, a weaker politics, uh, and territorial issues arising in Scotland and Ireland uh, are arising from the, uh, um, uh, from the decisions. Uh, the terms that come over to me in, in thinking about this is dysfunctionality within the UK state and a loss of statecraft, statecraft that used to characterize the, uh, the British approach, uh, but now uh, seems to be absent externally and internally, and they're seeking to repair that. Uh, that's another talking point about the, about that raised by the book. Uh, and in the Conclusion and the concluding point, it seems to me, and I put this back to Bridget and perhaps for discussion, is the current uh, uh, difficulties the EU is facing on the Middle East crisis as to how they bring the bring the um, uh, bring their positions together. Uh, there are uh, urgent meetings going on today as we speak. Uh, we've been following the uh, differences between von der Leyen and Charles Michel and other major players, and I, I wonder, you know. What that collective, where is that collective power Europe in, in this setting? And how do you apply the techniques of analysis that are developed in this book to that? Perhaps indeed, uh, it, it's a major set, a major geopolitical crisis, but perhaps indeed uh, the uh, methods that uh, Bridget identified may be applied, but they certainly need to be because uh, this is a very visible uh, crisis for the EU and it will uh, lead to disenchantment publicly unless they get their acts together. But they did get their acts together on the, on the, on the Brexit issue and that's a, a standing uh, uh, compliment to them. So thank you very much. Thank you.